because Lent is a season of repentance and seeking uh, of forgiveness, uh, a time of examination. Um, there is no psalm that comes to mind more than Psalm 51 um, when we think of the Lenten season. Uh, and part of that is because of Psalm 51 is uh, so big a part of the liturgy of so many of our denominations. When, uh, when Cramner wrote the Book of Common Prayer for Henry VIII, uh, Psalm 51 was one of his most important tools. And then that prayer book became the source for the prayer books of, or the books of worship for so many denominations that uh, it has literally become a part of our liturgy. Even those of us who don't think we're all that liturgical, when we hear the words of Psalm 51, we kind of go, oh, I know that one. Uh, and part of it's just because we've repeated it and said it so often. Now, I must share with you that in horror, I was greeted by uh, one of the couples in our Tuesday morning Bible study that we do by Zoom. Um, and uh, they are kind of the host. They're the, the technological hosts. They're the ones who make Zoom happen for the rest of us. Uh, but they, uh, they also have an RV, so uh, they travel all over the place. And the past uh, two or three weeks, they've been in Florida. One, one morning, they were in a McDonald's because the Wi-Fi was better there. Uh, sometimes they're in their RV if they're in a place where the Wi-Fi is strong. So she couldn't wait till I got on, and as, as we were beginning the study, she, she interrupted and uh, she, she knew that I was preaching on the songs from the lectionary, the Psalms uh, for Lent. And uh, she said, we worshiped in a church on Sunday and he was preaching the lectionary too. Uh, and he preached on the Psalm, Psalm 107. And she said, did you read that whole Psalm? And I said, uh, I said, no, I read selected verses. That, that psalm is like 40-some verses long. She says, I know, the guy where we were read the whole thing. And I, I think she was still recovering for that. I don't know what he preached, but he read the whole thing. Of course, I wanted to save time to hear from all of you. I... I, I shared with the folks in our prayer group that uh, I didn't sleep well last Saturday night. I was, uh, I guess, experiencing some, some fear that you would all just run me out of here uh, when I stopped and turned it over to you all um, to let the redeemed say so. Um, I went home and there was such a weight lifted off of me uh, and replaced by just a sense of joy that I had the privilege of hearing all of you give witness to your redemption in Christ. And wasn't it fascinating to see how differently God has redeemed us and brought us together. Didn't our hearts just kind of leap with joy? Uh, and I shared that a bit with our Tuesday morning Bible study. And I think they, they were just uh, in joy over the fact that I didn't read that whole psalm. But as you see, if you look at the outline for this morning's psalm, the first letter says, a song for which we have to sing all of the verses. You know, there are some songs that are like that. You, you can't just do excerpts. You actually have to do all the verses. And there have been churches that have probably split. I know uh, if some of you are familiar with Salome Church, and Chester Bethel Church, the two Methodist churches along Folk Road, years ago, they split over a new hymnal. 
That's how Chester Bethel came to be. Now, I'm sure there were some other things going on there as well. Uh, but oftentimes, music, instead of bringing us together, can split us apart. And in some churches, there are legalists who say, it's not a good church unless you sing all the verses to all the hymns. <sighs> you know, if I, if I read all of Psalm 107, we might still be here waiting for me to finish. What I think I'm going to do for Psalm 51 is instead of reading the scripture, I, I'm just going to dig right into it and we'll read it as we go. Uh, but you should be aware that there are certain hymns and songs that don't make any sense unless we look at the whole thing. On Epiphany Sunday, we usually sing in most churches, most traditional churches, We Three Kings. And being a king, that is a hymn that I think should be sung. <laughs> but you know, particularly on Epiphany Sunday when we sing that, the song doesn't make sense unless you sing all the verses. But it is also such a dull song, kind of a, oh, star of wonder, star of light. But if you actually pay attention, it tells the whole story. And you can almost kind of onanomapaically, some of you don't think I have a vocabulary, look that one up. You get a sense of them traveling all the way from the east to Israel and then back again. And of course, those of us who sang it as little kids, there was always the rubber cigar part of the verse that exploded, and we would all giggle in the back pew. Some of you who don't know that verse don't know anything about it. The way I would say, David knows it, he's laughing just thinking about it. Uh, the way I would solve the issue on Epiphany Sunday is we would sing it in excerpts throughout the service. Instead of singing all the verses as one, uh, we would sing the first two verses for the opening hymn and then the next two verses for the middle hymn, and I think there are six verses, the final verse or verses for the, that was the only hymn we sang, but we sang it in increments, and it was like, oh, this is okay. After all, you do have to stop at the rest stop so when you make a long trip, but you do have to sing that whole hymn for it to make sense. Other hymns, like the one we just sang, Praise him, praise him. First of all, the first thing you discover with that hymn is that it is difficult to get those words out to that rhythm. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Try to say that three times real fast. Well, when you sing that hymn, you're spitting at the person next to you as you're singing that one. But you know, you can just sing the first verse and the last verse, and no one will ever know the difference. It's one of those hymns. However, there's a, uh, a hymn writer, an Englishman, Stuart Townsend. He got together with an Irishman by the name of Keith Getty, and in the 1990s, they wrote a hymn which has become one of the most popular hymns of the church. In fact, it was voted in one poll the most popular in his name. And if you look at in his name and you listen to in his name, you realize you can't sing the first and the last verses. It doesn't make any sense. You must sing the whole thing. It tells the whole narrative of the gospel from beginning to end. So if you're going to bother with in his name, you must sing the whole thing. And then later, Townsend, the Englishman, wrote another hymn very similar to In His Name. We'll sing it on Maundy Thursday. How deep the Father's love for me. It does the same thing. If you wanted someone to understand the gospel, give them either one of those two hymns. Give them the words so that they can read along as they listen to the music. 
Well, Psalm 51 is like that. It's not like that fascinating song of the 60s and 70s, does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? If your mother says, don't chew it, do you swallow it in spite? Then you hang it on your tonsils and you heave it left and right. Does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? Does it really matter how many verses of that you sing? In fact, at one point it has in the verse, second verse, same as the first. Really doesn't matter. Folks, you just have this image of a piece of gum stuck in your throat going back and forth, and you can't get it to go down. That's it. Not Psalm 51. If you're not going to do all the verses, don't bother. If you are going to bother with Psalm 51, take a deep breath. Because there's no way to approach this psalm lightly. And you'll see, you kind of have to look at the, the verses and also at your sermon outline at the same time. We, we begin with the prelude. And the prelude, in most of our Bibles, there's, there's a little subtext under the number of the psalm. Um, and that's always a great advantage when we're studying the psalms, when we actually get a little note uh, that tells us what the context was for the psalm. And we'll see that the prelude for this psalm is that David wrote it after he was caught in his sin with Bathsheba, a sin of adultery that was then augmented and compounded by the fact to cover it up, he arranged for the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, who not only was one of his soldiers, he was listed in the scriptures as one of his mighty fighting men one of his top closest soldiers, one of the group of men who was with him when he was a renegade on the run from Saul. He had been with Uriah for a long time, and Uriah had been faithful to him and loyal to him, and he had arranged for his murder. That's the prelude. And he was so out of control in his sin and his arrogance of, as the king of Israel, where everything was so great and everybody was telling him he was so great that he had no conviction over this sin whatsoever. But his primary prophet, Nathan, knew what was going on. And he stepped in to his chambers one day and he told him a parable. A parable that David thought was a true story. And when he finished the parable, David was incensed at the injustice that he had heard in that story. And he said, that man should be killed. That man should be executed. And what did Nathan say? You are that man. And with that, the conviction of sin in David begins. I don't know what the original music was to Psalm 51, but you can imagine that prelude. And then the verses begin. And the first verse is comprised of verses 1 and 2 in our scripture lesson. And it is a statement on the nature of God and the king's intention. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. He's convicted of sin now, isn't he? So much so that he knows everything he deserves. Have mercy on me. 
According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I, I'm coming to you, Lord, without an excuse. Help. Don't help me from him, from her, from this or that. Help me because I have sinned. Any of you who grew up in the Catholic Church or any of you who watch movies or TV and see the confessional booth reenact it, are familiar with those words. How many of you are ex-Catholics? What do you say when you enter the confession booth? We say it to the priest. Forgive me. There it is. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's a good place to start, isn't it? And that's what David is doing. Second stanza is a continuation from, but not the same as the first. And you'll see in your outline that it is the stanza that contains the confession. For I know my transgressions, David said. I've not only sinned, let me tell you what my sin consists of. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. Now a lot of people get hung up on this verse when they read Psalm 51. They want to they want to avoid the whole impact of the psalm by kind of doing a dodge here. Well, it's not just against God that he sinned. How about Bathsheba? She's pregnant. He killed her husband, so he sinned against Bathsheba. And to just show how macho the world has been from the very beginning, there are still biblical commentators who have imagined that this was not David's fault, that Bathsheba led him into it. Trust me, folks, how do you say no to the monarch who has absolutely every control over all? But he says, against you and you only have I sinned. The most awful thing we can hear as we're trying to dodge our sins is having tried to lower it to just involving a, a human being or a human situation or some kind of problem. The last thing we want to hear is that we sin before God. There's no dodge when you come to the holy God. Is there? I remember when high school kids would come to me. <laughs> and sometimes they'd be in the midst of being defense, defensive about some sin. I didn't even know what they were talking about. And they would come attacking me. You think I committed a sin. You think I was wrong. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, why, why have you come up to me all of a sudden here at a high school football game? I, I'm just your friend. What did I do here? And sometimes gently, sometimes firmly, even harshly, we need to remind people, I'm not your problem. You're attacking me because you identify me as the person 
who first announced God's love for you and led you to a relationship with God, but I'm not your problem. If you've been involved in sin, your first issue is God. You've sinned against God. And you know it's tough to argue with God. Ask Job. When you realize who you're arguing with, it's tough. In fact, when Job finally got his chance, he just shut up. David rightly recognizes who he's pouring his heart out to. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Isn't that interesting? God is already forming our heart in the womb. He desires righteousness in us. And all of us, without exception, that old fundy saying from Isaiah, we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah. From the very beginning. David nails it. He's going to the right place. And he's not trying to dodge anymore. In fact, he was so out of it. He was so arrogant. He was so lost in sin that he committed adultery and killed a man to cover it up and felt no conviction of sin whatsoever. He was just lollygogging his way through each day, having a wonderful time until Nathan came in and took him out of his little daydream and said, you are that man. Woo! Third stanza, verses 7 to 12. Cleansing and restoration. This is a great section to the hymn. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. One of the great ads. And, of course, they always emphasize grimy dirt. Sometimes I wonder how a bathtub could get so ugly. When they do the ad for the Mr. Clean magic white pads, you know, and the person's cleaning the bathtub, and you're thinking, what in the world did you have on you when you got in that bathtub? And that little pad just takes it off like magic. Must be made of hyssop. I must admit, my son, the bachelor, I've seen his tub. They could use it for the ad. And my reaction to it is, how can you do that? He said, Dad, I have hired a person once a month to come in and clean. You ought to see how clean that is after she leaves. Smart move. David, recognizing that he's as filthy as that tub, says, cleanse me, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, does this sound familiar? Mr. Clean? Create in me a pure heart, O God, 
and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. We can't stop there. We don't want to leave the confessional till we've gotten the bath and the tub's been cleaned. And it's so good. It's so white. It's so smooth that we begin to realize the joy of our salvation. I have a friend who died this past week. And as you get older, it's a little bit frustrating. I once trained him for work crew when he was a high school kid. And then a mutual friend informed me that he was having heart surgery and began to share with me Facebook posts detailing every medical fact that was involved. As it turned out, his heart was so weak, they couldn't do the surgery. They had to do a couple things to try to strengthen him, and then finally they got him strong enough that they were able to put a couple of stints in, but then my person, I'm not on Facebook, so this person kept texting me detailed analyses, and of course I'm married to a nurse, so I'm passing this on to Marlo, and her eyes are rolling because she knows what all this stuff means, and frankly, having been married to a nurse all these years, even I knew what all of this meant, and and the person who was communicating is saying, I'm praying for a miracle, and I'm thinking to myself, we ought to pray for peace for his children and his friends because if he recovers from this, he's not going to have anything left. And if he's too old for a transplant, and, of course, that humbles you a bit because I had him as a kid. What does that make me? He's not eligible for a transplant. That's, that's all that would solve the problem. And finally, he made the decision, along with his three adult children, but he made the decision that he was going to be removed uh, from the machines. And before he did, he went over with his son what the funeral service was going to be. And his son commented, I know, Dad. His son's a pastor. He says, I know, Dad. You've taught me well. <laughs> I love that line. They removed him from the ventilator and other machines. And shortly after, he died peacefully. And as he was going through that, I read in one of my Lenten devotionals that was on Psalm 51 that what David is asking for here is a complete spiritual heart transplant. It's not enough just to put a stent in. He recognizes that he needs a complete transplant. And you know, that's what you all were saying last week. When you stood before the congregation and in so many different ways declared with thanksgiving 
God transplanted my heart of sin and created in me a new heart, a clean heart that only he could do. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Keep good blood pumping through me. Through the power of your spirit, keep your presence within me. How David came up with that in the Old Covenant, he was anticipating that day when Jesus on Pentecost would give us his Holy Spirit to sustain us and equip us and encourage us, to give us courage to do all that he called us to do. Wow. And then finally, in the fourth stand, a, a commitment to an exercise of repentance. Then I will teach transgressors your way uh, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my God and Savior. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Don't You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. By the way, David is using a little hyperbole. God did delight in sacrifice. But not as a way for us to conquer our sins as a way for us to give thanks and praise for the fact that he has conquered our sins. God delights when we celebrate the sacrament. As we come with repentant hearts and with a sense of joy that we are in his presence and give thanks for the sacrifice that he has made so that we can live in his freedom. God does delight in that, but, but not when our hearts aren't right. Our sacrifices mean nothing. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, you will not despise that. And then he has a little postlude. And David will tell you, just like with this psalm, none of you probably remember this postlude verse here, and David will tell you when he plays the postlude uh, after worship, unless he has his buddy Chuck along to play the trumpet and get your attention again, most of us aren't even listening to the postlude. We're just getting out of here. I was in one church where they insisted that everybody remain seated for the postlude. Quite often in churches where they have these highly paid organists or sometimes when the organist is playing from up in the balcony uh, of the large uh, sanctuary, everyone will turn for the postlude and look up and the organist will do his or her thing. David, if you could arrange, fill the little... Uh, uh, balcony in the back there and put a piano on it to make sure it's good enough to hold the piano and you can sneak up there and play the postlude each week. Here is the postlude that David uh, prepares for his song and it's all about the people because David is not just like you or I. Well, he's kind of like me. My name is King. David was the king. So in his sin, he recognizes that restoration must be made not only for him, but because of what he's done and its impact on the people, and it will have an impact for years to come. He prays for the people. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, 
in burnt offerings offered whole, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Quite a psalm, isn't it? Don't skip any verses. And in your own lives, in our own lives, let's make it our commitment not to skip any verses. We're almost there in this season of Lent, folks. Next week, we will have many opportunities for worship, many opportunities for reflection, for confession, for repentance, and just plain remembering what Christ has done for us on the cross and in the resurrection. Don't miss it. Let us walk through it together. Hang in there. Wait for the Lord. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this psalm. And all of us, along with David, echo that refrain that you would create in us clean hearts, holy and acceptable before you. We recognize that no matter what our effort is, we can't do that. Only you can do it. We thank you that that is our great hope and our great reality because you have already begun that good work, O oh Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.